Hi, I'm John Cook, Chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Sciences here at the Houston Methodist Research Institute. And I'm with uh, Dr. Eduardo Marban, who gave, just gave a brilliant talk on uh, deconstructing cardiovascular regeneration. Uh, we're going to be talking about that in a minute. Um, Dr. Marban, welcome. Thank you, John. Um, I wanted to start, before we start talking about the science, which was spectacular, I mean, you, you started from very basic science and, and translated that basic science into clinical trials, uh, something that we aspire to do here at the Houston Methodist Research Institute. Um, tell us a little bit, before we get into the science, tell us a little bit about um, how you got to where you are right now. You did your training at uh, Yale, most of your early training, and then you uh, were a professor at Johns Hopkins, uh, and then left for Cedars. Uh, tell us about what, what was uh, responsible for that decision to, to leave Johns Hopkins and then start the uh, Cedars Heart Institute. Well, um, I had, as you mentioned, I had been an MD PhD student at, uh, at Yale. I had been fortunate to work with uh, Dick Chen, who's uh, now in the National Academy of Sciences, and with his brother Roger, who went on to win the Nobel Prize in, in chemistry. Mm -hmm. um, and my first paper was a first author full length article in Nature, and I thought, this is the way everything works. <laughs> 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 so that was a an excellent patrimony to take into uh, postgraduate clinical training. I went on to Hopkins and started as an intern and uh, left there having been chief of cardiology for, um, for several years. The opportunity um, at uh, Cedars-Sinai to create from scratch uh, a new uh, heart institute was compelling for various reasons. First of all, Cedars-Sinai had a great legacy in having been the home of Myron Prince Metal and Elliot Corday. Uh, Elliot Corday was one of the founders of the American College of Cardiology and one of Eisenhower's uh, cardiologists. And Prince Metal, of course, epidemic uh, syndromes and quite a thought leader. And then um, uh, Jeremy Swan was recruited there from the Mayo Clinic, teamed up with this professor who had been at Cedars for some time named Willie Gans, and together they created the Swan-Gans catheter. Mm -hmm. This is uh, in the 80s and 90s. And as, um, as I was a cardiology fellow in training, I got used to the, uh, uh, the experience of opening up the New England Journal and seeing uh, often a lead article there by Jim Forrester, Swan and Gans, establishing the basis of the fourth heart sound using um, hemodynamic monitoring to uh, assess the efficacy of vasodilators, et cetera. So a lot of the seminal work on hemodynamics uh, at the bedside was done at Cedars in the 80s and 90s. So I, I knew the place. I knew its proud legacy. Um, it uh, had failed to grow uh, along with the expansion of, of cardiology elsewhere. So when I, um, when I interviewed there and looked at the opportunity, I saw it as a growth opportunity with a fantastic legacy, very entrepreneurial leadership that uh, could set us up for success. And um, uh, what I additionally found attractive about the opportunity was the fact that it was uh, not directive. It was not stepping into a position that already existed. Um, so many of the important leadership positions are taking over something and hoping you don't screw it up. Mm -hmm. And this was a, an opportunity to do something from scratch and try to actually propel this um, institution with a proud legacy into uh, a prominent leadership position uh, in the present. And uh, I've had some, some luck in doing that. And you've certainly done that. Uh, Cedar sinai now ranks number three in the U.S. News and World Report for uh, cardiovascular. Uh, so spectacular job. Congratulations. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, science. Uh, that uh, you introduced us to today, uh, your work with uh, cardiospheres. Um, you uh, showed us that these cardiospheres have remarkable regenerative properties, um, and it appears that uh, a lot of it has something to do with the exosomes that they release. Maybe you could expand on that a little bit. These cardiospheres cells, cardiosphere-derived cells, and the exosomes they release and the regenerative effects of those. This journey started um, maybe 14 or 15 years ago. We were looking at stem cells from um, 
embryonic sources, real pluripotent stem cells as candidate cells for creating biological pacemakers. And um, at the time, as we were studying these, as I realized how uh, conceptually and theoretically appealing they were, I began to realize that there were a number of translational obstacles to actually using them for hum human therapeutics. Very immature cells with tumorigenic potential that could, if implanted into the heart, create arrhythmias and uh, immune rejection and all sorts of other practical concerns. So um, I uh, shifted my attention from the biological pacemaker to more kind of cardiomyoplasty strategies. What cell type might we be able to use that's not an embryonic stem cell or pluripotent stem cell? And we um, uh, started thinking about this at about the time when there was a lot of intellectual ferment in the field and multiple independent labs described some kind of cardiac progenitor cell, putative cardiac progenitor cell. That literature has gotten murkier over time rather than clearer, but at the time there was some hope that um, the heart did indeed contain a, a reservoir of uh, cells that might be helping the heart with a little bit of uh, turnover every year, maybe 1% mm -hmm. of cardiomyocytes are now thought to turn over normally yearly on, in mammals. I mean, uh, there's some argument about whether the figure is one half of 1% or 2%, but it's on that order of magnitude. Mm -hmm. It's not very big, but the idea would be that maybe if there are cells in the heart that support that turnover, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, one could amplify them ex vivo and put them into regions of injury and perhaps tilt the balance away from uh, fibrosis and towards repair. So we, um, rather than affiliating with any of the uh, major groups that had isolated different cells on the basis of antigenic panning, we decided to take a much more practical approach and um, uh, use primary culture to get cells from human biopsy specimens. And these cells um, uh, form uh, self-assembling spheroids, and they're called cardiospheres, that have a lot of um, stem cell-like properties. They um, they're certainly beneficial in terms of functional structure when you uh, implant them into uh, models of a myocardial infarction, and they have multi-lineage potential. So we created a recipe for making that in sort of a clinically friendly way from endomyocardial biopsies. And in so doing, had at the time the uh, idea that there could be a rel relatively rapid uh, translation. And from the sort of eureka moment of using this recipe and endomyocardial biopsies to the first clinical trial in patients who had had an MI was maybe five years. So from a point of view of a biologic uh, translation, that's uh, fairly that's fast. That's spectacular. That's, that's very fast. Five years from the observation, scientific observation, to the clinical application in a trial. No, it was fast. And we were lucky because um, in um, many cases where you have good proof of concept data in animals and you get into human beings, things don't work out that way or there's safety concerns. Certainly the lessons of early mm -hmm. uh, gene therapy uh, haunted us and um, the first uh, infusion in a human being was being filmed live by CBS News. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so the stakes were not exactly low, but luckily everything worked out well from the safety point of view and, um, and now as I reviewed in the in the lecture uh, earlier today, there's um, uh, some hints of efficacy. Mm -hmm. Not all in uh, the initial target diseases that we were interested in, in heart failure and myocardial infarction, which are still of, uh, of interest to us, but it turned out that the cells produced signaling particles, these exosomes that contain a myriad of proteins and non-coding RNA that seem to be very generalizable in their principles of action and mm -hmm. uh, affect not only the heart but many other uh, organs and disease states. So it may not be the cells themselves that are, that are having the regenerative effect, but the, what they produce, the exosomes that they're producing uh, may be having the regenerative benefit. Yeah, the totality of the evidence now, John, is that the cells act by uh, paracrine or exocrine mechanisms mm -hmm. and uh, produce factors that um, not only affect neighboring cells but may have the potential to travel throughout the circulation and, uh, and affect uh, distant cells as well. 
Uh, and um, they have particularly intense and generalizable anti-inflammatory effects mm -hmm. and anti-fibrotic effects, mm -hmm. which may make them useful in a variety of uh, diseases that cardiologists don't normally uh, think about, things like uh, lupus and renal failure and graft-versus-host disease. Uh, so um, the journey for me has been uh, not only a, a practical one in which we had to sort of change our target as, as our understanding evolved, but also an intellectual one. I've had to think about diseases that I hadn't thought about since medical school. Mm -hmm. and, um, but, you know, the path of opportunity uh, is a fertile one, and you just yes. have to follow it. Yeah. Um, for me, it raises one last question that I'd like to ask you, and, and that is we have, you've shown that, that we have these regenerative cells in the heart. Uh, you've shown us that uh, these cells re release exosomes that are therapeutic, that have regenerative properties, that have anti-inflammatory properties. Raises the question for me is, um, are there diseases that are associated with an impairment of this regenerative system? Are, um, and, 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 and along those lines, how is it that when, as we age, we're, we're apparently losing this regenerative capacity uh, of this uh, endogenous reservoir of cells and the exosomes they release? Yeah, those are lifelong, you've defined questions that could, could uh, occupy uh, really good investigators uh, for a lifetime and set you up for a career. Uh, they're not trivial questions, they're important ones. And so I'm gonna just try to go after a very small subset of that in giving a factual answer, and that is that we now have evidence that the exosomes secreted by young cells, when infused in a cell-independent fashion into an old uh, rat, can actually rejuvenate the rat. Um, and um, they seem to be um, much more efficacious at doing that than exosomes from an older animal. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I'm not saying that exosomes necessarily are the fountain of youth, but I do think that there's something with normal aging that changes the um, endocrine phenotype, as it were, of the um, exosomes and that we may be able to um, exploit some of these uh, rejuvenating properties to affect not only cardiovascular enhancement, but also possibly to affect other uh, pathological manifestations of aging um, or pathophysiological manifestations of aging. We're only beginning to understand that, and so, but it may be that one subset answer to your global question is that impairment of exosome content or function may underlie some of the differences that we see in natural aging among, among individuals. Mm -hmm. Great. Wonderful. Thanks for those insights. Thanks for joining us today. My uh, pleasure. And, and this will conclude our interview. Thank you so Thank much. You, John. Yeah.